Well, it's cold and blustery outside, as it usually is in February, but inside Cobo Hall, it's warm and friendly, and everybody's talking about summer. This is the Detroit Boat and Fishing Show, the biggest and best show that's ever been held here. The exhibit space has been sold out since last fall. Crowds have been at capacity sizes. 30,000 people went through here last Sunday. That's an all-time record. We've been setting records every day. We're talking about hunting, fishing, camping, boating. The show really has a new look. And if you can't make it down before Sunday, well, hang on because we're going to give you the best tour we can. Because it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore in... Well, here we are, the Michigan Outdoors crew at the Boat and right. Fishing Show. This is one of the few times on this day we're going to all be in the booth. Where, where are you going to be, Ed? Well, I'm going to be all over. I'm going to be all over this boat show. Bob? And I've, I've got to see a lot more things at the boat show. There's so much to see. Kathy, that means you're going to have to hold the fort down. This is my times. office. This is your office right here. You can come down and see us. It will mainly be here. But some of the time, you're going to find me at least every other hour. Come on, follow me right over here to our Michigan Outdoors stage area. Right up here is where I stand every other hour and talk about all kinds of things, demonstrate archery, guns, even fly casting. Now, this line simulates fly line. It's heavy. You know, the little puff of uh, yarn here on the end is sort of like a fly. It really doesn't weigh anything. If you can learn to cast a rod with yarn, you can learn to cast the fly rod that I just demonstrated. Now, this is what most people do. They bring it back and they throw it forward. It piles up at their feet. I'll even put out a little more line. Go like this. Look at that. And I, I cast it really hard, and I can't get it to lay out there like it should. Fly casting, you have to be patient to fly cast. The patience occurs at one spot. After your back cast, let the line straighten out. That's all you have to do. If it's straightened out behind, you can take it forward and it'll lay right out like that. So flip it back, let it straighten out and go forward. See the difference in that? You can lay it out there like a fly should lay on the water. Hesitate, wait till it straightens out and put it forward. If I go too fast, this is what happens. Lands at my feet. That's the trick to fly casting. Now shotguns, most people shoot them incorrectly. Trap shooters know how to do it, and maybe you've seen trap shooters shoot. You know, they get like this, and they put their arms up before they say pull, and you think, what kind of style is that? These people really look silly. There's a reason for shooting a shotgun that way. Rifle shooting, you put your arms down. That's how you shoot a rifle. So you don't, you can lock in. If you were duck hunting, uh, goose hunting, and a goose flies over, a duck comes behind you, you know how oftentimes you run out of room, like you go like that and you couldn't get it, you couldn't get a shot? That's because you have your arms down. With shotguns, if you have a chance, stand with your feet about as far apart as your shoulders, bend forward slightly at the waist, bring the gun to your shoulder and put your arms up. You'd be surprised how that increases your ability to swing. You can swing smoothly, you can swing all the way around. But if you put your arms down, you can't. Now look at how the front legs are connected to the deer. Can you see that? Can everybody see how they're connected? Can you see that? See? So what you want to do is go down to your workshop and get either a hacksaw or a crescent wrench because they're connected by a bolt here. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that ties these shoulder blades to the deer. And it's the same thing with you. Your shoulder blades are floating, so you can take your knife and cut it up and take that whole shoulder off. You got a roast there, you got some meat there that if you bone it out and cut the fat off, it'll be great. Same type of thing with the back leg, but here's the trick. The loins, most of the good meat is right along the top of the deer. Fillet it like a fish. Take your knife, cut right down like that, just like you do a fish, and cut it off. You got the loin off of there. If you cut the fat off and cut the membrane off, it's going to taste great. It's going to taste great. There's only one reason archers miss the target. Only one. They're aimed at the target, and they have it aimed, and they let go of the arrow, and they say, oh, the arrow, something happened there, you know? The string, the string jump or some darn thing. No, they moved the bow before the arrow cleared the arrow rest because that arrow was gonna go where this bow is aimed. And if it goes off to the side, then I aimed it off to the side. As I let go, I pushed the bow over. The trick is, hold it steady until the arrow hits the target, at least until the arrow clears the bow. Now that balloon 
is maybe eight yards away, but I'm going to aim at it as I draw. And when I get back at full draw, I'm still aimed. I'm still aimed right in the middle. Now I squeeze my back. I normally don't talk so much when I shoot. Pretty close to the middle. Ray Underwood, I want to be the one of the people, many people that shake your hand for a heck of a boat show this year. It's uh, quite a turnout. You know, I noticed that the, the boat show has kind of changed over the last few years. Well, it has, uh, Ed. You know, we started in 1957 with a small show at the Detroit Armory, and now we're the third largest boat show in the country. And with the addition of the fishing and outdoor section, it's just, it's going to grow tremendously. We anticipate another 100,000 square feet next year. That's going to be a heck of a big show. How is that going to rank then with another 100,000 feet as far as the rest of the United States? We would be at number two in the country at that point in time. And there's a lot of new things to see. And I think Fred is over to booth right now. It's something that usually you wouldn't think at a boat show. And one of the other things that's expanding here at the show is the travel exhibits. Why, we have Mike Ignat, who came all the way down from Houghton Lake. What do you got there, Mike? This is the official tip-up we used to catch the fish in Houghton Lake. Up at Tip-Up Town, USA. And here, Dick Fuller, you were the chairman of Tip-Up Town this past year. Right. One of the biggest and best we've ever had. And thanks to you and your program, helped a lot. Okay, well, people can come down here, find out about Houghton Lake. In fact, Bob Garner right now is over at the Alpena booth way up to the tip of uh, northern lower Michigan. And, uh, you know, we could, get, we could give him a T-shirt like this if he could fit in it. Well, Fred, I've got something here that fits me right to a T, the great hunting and fishing in the Alpena area. You betcha. Uh, <laughs> Jerry Shanky from the Alpena Chamber of Commerce. How's the brown trout fishing been up there? It's been good and getting better. The plants have been fantastic the last two years, and this year looks like it's going to be a super year for browns. Well, I can't wait to get up there and try it. We have so many fish to be caught in Michigan, it's incredible, but you gotta admit, there's a few on the Canadian side too. Look at those walleye. Dennis Dresser, you uh, work with John Miner on the other side of the lake? Yes, I do. Don't do too bad. What about the price of those Canadian licenses though? A lot of people are concerned about that down here. Uh, it's not quite as high as everybody's uh, been talking about. It's $10 for a four day permit and uh, $30 for a season, but with your discount on the money and everything, mm -hmm. it would be uh, approximately eight dollars for the four-day permit and twenty-four dollars for the season. I know I've heard a lot of things people have said a hundred dollars and mm -hmm. that sort of thing so it isn't quite as bad as what everybody's uh, been led to believe. Uh, that's good news but do you still have fish like this in Lake St. Clair sure on the do. Canadian side? There's lots of them out there. Okay. All you have to do is fish for them. Okay well John isn't here tonight but this is Captain John Miner with a, a row of muskies that they took. I tell you he's something going over Canadian fishing with John Miner is something and also if you want to get far up into Canada Bob Garner's over there talking to Carl Salling. Carl, you really have to go to northern Ontario to get into big trophy fish, though. Yes, I really think so. I think uh, we're fishing waters, for instance, that are four and 500 miles north of Thunder Bay and Lake Superior on lakes that are huge lakes and uh, con consistently produce big northern pike. So for consistency, for trophy fish, where to go? We're fishing North Caribou and Big Trout Lake. As I said, they're way up in the boondocks. Well, Bob, I am probably the only person who has been behind these, this railing right here. This is Frank Newmeyer's exhibit of mounted ducks and waterfowl. He is the best in the world. There's no doubt about it. He has a few of his pieces here. Now, he is going to be leaving with his exhibit on Saturday because he has to go down to South Carolina. He does exhibits all over North America. So this is only going to be here through the first part of Saturday's show. But he has mounted ducks here, uh, the ruffed grouse, which is absolutely spectacular. And this special exhibit here here, called Only for a Moment, has a tape recording with it, which really sets the mood. No doubt about it, Larry Malski, these ducks here at the Detroit Boat and Fishing Show Boy, they're one big attraction. Yeah, we, we're real happy with the way things come out this year. We put a lot of work into the pond, got some beautiful ducks, and we really think the people appreciate it. Well, you represent the Michigan Duck Hunters Association, an organization I plan to join before the show is over. Uh, tell us about some of the good things you do for ducks in Michigan. Well, Bob, we try to do a lot of work around the state. We do some nesting projects, some bird banning. In the case of southeastern Michigan, we move some geese where they're in, in nuisance uh, numbers. We also put on some duck ID classes to help the people know what they're doing when they're out in the field. Well, these ducks right here are in their finest plumage. When do you think they're going to come back? 
Well, I'm predicting an early spring, and let's hope we're going to see him at the 1st of April. Well, what you're looking at is uh, one of the winning entries in the 1983 Outdoor Writers Association of America Photographic Contest. And, it, you know, from one of the exhibits that's, well, it's kind of like uh, one that doesn't really stand out. You know, there's been all sorts of people looking at it. You know why? Look at this photo of this bald eagle. There are black and white and color photos here, and you know all of them are just beautiful. And I guess that's something you can expect, the outdoor riders shooting some just great nature photography. But this is only one of the kinds of art here at the boat show. That's right, Ed. Everything from photos, taxidermy, to very realistic paintings. Our sportsman category, here's marine art. The public has been voting on these throughout the week. Sporting dogs, some real cute ones there. General wildlife, some fish prints, white-tailed deer. We're going to come up with our winners, but they'll be the ribbons will be hanging on these after Thursday, after this show. Here's an exhibit by Tom Wolf. Look at his taxidermy. He was named to be our fish taxidermist of the year in 1983. Just some super mounts. Moving down to Wolf Creek, this is Jean Roll. She did not only the best mammal taxidermy last year, uh, as judged by the judges, but also this was the number one deer head. It was a doe, no rack at all. And Charlie Fanta, on the heels of Frank Neumeyer, uh, has turned in uh, some of the best upland game and waterfowl, and we judged him to be our waterfowl taxidermist of the year. And right now, this will get you in the mood for looking at some big bucks and big deer. Let's go to Bob Garner over there, who's talking with... Uh, I don't know who he's talking with for on commemorative bucks. Here at the commemorative bucks booth, you get a chance to see some great looking headgear on some unpredictably, or let's say predictably anymore, southern Michigan deer. Right, we're proving that in our records. Uh, that one there is, was taken in Lapeer County, was shot in 1983, and it's the biggest one we're aware of right now. The biggest one, to your knowledge? In, in the typical class only. Now, we also have another one in a non typical class that was shot in Oakland County. Adjacent counties? Right. You're, you're, southern Michigan, yeah. Southern Michigan, and more and more deer are coming from Southern Michigan with a big headgear. The bigger deer, that's right. Yeah, well, the records well, are proving it. Well, Joe, you're a taxidermist, and that's what they look like after they're mounted. Right. But to find out how they're mounted, let's go over to Fred Trost, and he's over there with Brad Bruce, and they're mounting one right now. Okay, fine. Let's go. Well, here's a face only a mother could love. <laughs> Tell me, Brad, it's not done yet. No, it's not done. We've got to put the cape on it yet, Fred. It's okay. clayed up, ready to go. The eyes are set and we are gonna put the deer head together here tonight. Okay, well I'm talking to Brad Bruce, who every day is demonstrating the mounting of a deer head. Let me move through here. Is Tracy's gonna put the cape on? Right, we're gonna go ahead and hang it. It's ready to go. Now this form, of course, is, what is that? It's made of uh, polyurethane foam. It's a high density foam material that will take the pins and what we're gonna do here to go ahead and clean the head up. Hi, folks. Come down to the boat. No, this is kinda <laughs> tacky, isn't it? <laughs> But these, these deer heads really do look fine when you get them done. How long does it take to mount a head? We usually figure about 8 to 10 hours, Fred. And uh, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but uh, right around that uh, time frame. How many heads uh, do you mount uh, with, with Brad during a fall season? Oh, this year we took in 110. Wow. From that's including out west work. Mm -hmm. And we took about 60 or 70 whitetails in from Michigan. Well, there's an awful lot of deer that have been taken. Go ahead, Tracy, you can finish this out. Every day they're demonstrating the mounting of a deer head. It rouses a lot of curiosity here. And Brad, you are uh, one of the board members of the Michigan Taxidermist Association. Right. And uh, you held a taxidermy competition down here for deer heads. Yes, we did. And of course, the one that won was a little more advanced stage than this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and here is one of the ribbon winners, uh, number 13, a third place, but there are actually three third place ribbons here, Brad. Well, each individual deer head is judged on its own merits, Fred, okay? Mm -hmm. Theoretically, <clears throat> excuse me, theoretically every one of them could have, could have placed higher, lower, whatever. They're judged individually, and uh, they're scored accordingly, and if they warrant a ribbon, they get a ribbon. So that's basically, you know, okay. the way we're doing it. Looks like the spike bucks and the four corns. That, now, that doesn't have anything to do with it, does it? No, the horns uh, do not enter into it whatsoever. Well, yeah, here's a second place right, right here that's a button buck. Right. First place, a couple first place winners. Are these two the best ones? Uh, they're two of the three that were what we call the blue ribbon winners down here. We who, have, who did uh, the other blue ribbon uh, winning? Uh, <laughs> I did. Oh well, let's go down here and see the one Brad Bruce did. Now the judges, when they were judging these, didn't know which 
deer were mounted by which taxidermist? Right. It was done only by number. So congratulations, Brad. Thank you. It, Thank it, you. Some people probably said foul ball. Yeah, right. You know? I'm sure. <laughs> but this was no. truly the two taxidermists to judge this are from the Michigan Taxidermist Association. Now, this is an unusual mount, Brad. It's unusual in the state of Michigan. It's been pretty popular out west for the last mm -hmm. several years. Uh, it's basically referred to as an open mouth, white tailed head mount, and they're just not that popular yet in the state of Michigan. Well, everything from button bucks to these number one award-winning heads right down here at the Boat and Fishing Show is really something to see. Well, you're looking at another Michigan product. It's called the Charger Lure. I'm here with Ted Rustovich, the inventor's son. Is that correct. correct? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, now, why is this a great lure? Why am I going to catch fish with this lure? Well, this lure is going to get you out in the weeds, like no other lure you'd ever have. Where the fish are, out exactly. in the weeds. Exactly, right. exactly. See, it has a weed guard. Mm -hmm. Instead of weed wires, Yeah. okay, that's the weed guard, and this is the treble hook right here. Uh -huh. When the fish strikes, that's when the hooks come out. So this is, this is better than a weed wire, then, you're yes, saying? Yes, sir. Weed wires give way under tension, mm -hmm. and this weed guard is made to hold up and last and hold that hook together. So you can cast with it, you can troll with it. If you're casting, does this ever happen to you? Never. Oh, come on, oh. you're not fishing right then. <laughs> <laughs> you get wrapped up with twice and we'll even try. Just pull, that weed guard's doing its job by holding those hooks in there. And it's not snapping off. Exactly. All right. That's the idea. Well, show us that action again. Sure thing. This is the Charger Lure. It's just uh, been out for just a couple of years. and uh, The Wheelist has been out for two years. We'll have to give it a try sometime in the future. Thank you very much. Your body version of exposure. And again, that's the, the basic philosophy that we're trying to say. Could I butt in a second? You guys mind? What we're doing is popping in on this panel discussion here on Tuesday night which poses the question, are any Michigan fish unsafe to eat? Okay? This is, this is sort of a serious part here of uh, the Boat and Fishing Show, but something which is very important, Dr. Ron Skoog, DNR director. Are any Michigan fish unsafe to eat, in your estimation? Yeah, what have I've, you been telling the crowd? Well, we've been telling them that uh, there are situations, and such as... Uh, was just to explain the uh, fish in our advisory, for example, from the Saginaw, the Tippewasi rivers, uh, downstream, particularly from the Dow area. There's enough concern being expressed with regard to the contaminants in the river system there and in the fish we've been testing to, to warrant uh, warning people not to eat fish from, from that area. It'd be better off not to do that. Okay, now the public health department is issuing those warnings, right? That's correct. Okay, let me move down here to public health. Dr. Humphreys, you have issued the warning. Bottom line, are they safe or mm. unsafe to eat? If I took them, cooked them up in a recipe, would they be unsafe? You haven't named the fish or the, the source. OK, uh, let's take a carp from below the Titabawasi. Is it unsafe if I ate one today? Uh, we would feel that uh, uh, carp from the Titabawasi River should not be eaten. It, runs, it stands a good probability of being unsafe. What would happen to me if I ate it? Uh, probably nothing. Okay, now I'm not going to press you any farther on that. This is something that we have to make up our minds on. Dr. Matt Zabik. You know, big fella, you started some research on dioxin that really got a lot of publicity. Yes. Are you proud of that? Well, how do you feel about <laughs> that? I never expected all the publicity that we, we got from that study because it was a very preliminary type study and it was w way overplayed in the press as far as the scare end of it. The uh, Midland area. Now, that doesn't go to say, that doesn't mean to say that every fish in that... Well, here at the boat show, I think sometimes we might take boating safety for granted, but I'm with uh, Jerry Boyne of the Wayne County Sheriff Association and you don't take boating safety for granted, do you? We sure don't. Uh, we're in the process now of teaching classes around the county of Wayne. And uh, our classes involve uh, safe boating, of course. Uh, not only safe boating, we go into water safety. We go into uh, first aid, a uh, first aid on the water, and talk about hyperthermia. Now, can anybody take these classes? Uh, yes, uh, the ages uh, basically are set up from 12 to 16. But if the youngster is going to be 12 within the boating season, and that is from uh, even up to October. If he's 11 and a half years old, for instance, we surely want him in class and his license won't become valid until he's 12. 
but at least we've got him taught when he does get out on the water. Now on your screen you've seen the uh, a number for the Wayne County Sheriff's Association, but if they're not in the Wayne County area, where can they find out about uh, boating safety classes? Okay, each Sheriff's Department within the state of Michigan puts on these classes with their marine divisions in public school areas, uh, park and recreation areas, and places like that, and all they have to do is call their local Sheriff's Department to get involved with these schools. Well, Ed, there are all kinds of charter captains here. All of them have been checked out by the uh, Coast Guard, the DNR, for safety. Come on down here. Follow me down here, OJ. We're going to look around at some of the exhibits. Of course, we're stepping on the outer edge of the Michigan Outdoors section, all into the different boats, fishing boats, speed boats. Over here, we have some Canadian resorts. Oh, look at those walleye and northern pike. We're going to go down here to an uh, exhibit that... Uh, well, it's something that I kind of like to see at the Boat and Fishing Show here. It's something that hasn't been here for a while. Oh, on the way, we come across Emil Dean, Captain Emil on the Manistee River. We also have Pete Rubianis, Steve Jones, Hank Bradley. They're all here doing seminars. Here we are, Johnson Enterprise. How you doing, Greg? Pretty good. Fred. Hey, I really whooped you at speedcasting the other night, didn't I? Yeah, uh, practice, I guess, makes perfect. Okay. <laughs> You're offering a special here to fishermen who bring the reels down. I sure am. Uh, my my regular price at the shop is $5. I'll go right through reel, clean it, and lube it. What I've got here at the show, bring down your reel. As you're watching the show, I will take apart your reel, clean it, and lube it right at the show for $2. Can't beat that. Such a bargain we have right here at the Boat and Fishing Show. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Girls, girls, what are you doing, Kathy? You're here getting some tips from Kay? Right, she's going to teach us how to bake. What is it, Kay? Salmon. We're going to have salmon with dill sauce. Salmon with dill sauce. Seems to me we the recipe we scheduled in our club digest was pike, baked pike and dill sauce. Right, and we just don't happen to have any pike today, Fred, so we're going to use uh, Chinook salmon. Are a lot of your recipes interchangeable like that? Oh, yes, all fish recipes are. Except for sheep's head when you boil it like monkfish. Oh, well, I'm not sure about <laughs> that, Fred. I'd love to show you that. So what are you putting in here, Kathy? You want this on here now? We're putting in tomatoes, Fred. Just... So Stewed we put, tomatoes. let's see, you put on some seasoning salt. Mm-hmm. Seasoning pepper. Seasoning, seasoning pepper, onions, and, and now the, the secret of the recipe is dill seed. Dill seed. Let's get a close-up on this dill seed here. Go ahead. How much are you using? I'm going to use a half a teaspoon because we're using a, a half a recipe. Those look like they could start crawling around there, you know that? <laughs> well, they might. <laughs> I think dill is real versatile. It is. I use it quite a bit. You're going to microwave this? Yes, we are. And it's going to take approximately five minutes in the microwave. Okay. So why don't you put it in the microwave here, uh, and, and we're going to take it out in just a moment, but we're going to do it through the magic of videotape. You people hungry? Certainly. You ever had, uh, what is this, baked dill, baked pike and dill sauce? Only Except it's salmon. only it's salmon. Oh, good. You want some? Sure. Okay, well, Kay Ritchie does this uh, continually here. Go ahead, Kay, pop it out of the oven. Microwave for about five minutes or so. Under the saran wrap. Let me get a whiff of that. Ooh, it smells good. Oh, boy, that does smell good. You really smell the dill. Well, if you guys want some, you gals, come on up here, get a taste. This is in our Club Digest, which you can find the address at the end of the show. You can come down to the Boat and Fishing Show and taste some of this. Just excellent. While we've learned how to cook a recipe here, many recipes from Kay Ritchie, Ed is over in the, uh, what is it, the seminar area, I think with Tony Fidanzo learning about fishing techniques. Well, a bass boat like this is just about everybody's dream, but you know, a boat like this doesn't do you any good if you can't catch the fish. No, it doesn't do you much good at all if you can't catch them. Well, I'm with Tony Fidanzo of the Berkeley Company, and they have a presentation on fish sensory perception over in the exhibition area that's just out of this world. I mean, you can learn just about everything there is to know about fish. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there are important things about catching fish, as you know. So, Well, what's, what, what would you say if, if, I, if somebody was to go over there, what's probably the most important thing they're going to learn from your presentation? How to catch fish. The main thing on fish catching is the senses of fish, the five senses that fish use to avoid being caught. And that's what we're trying to teach people. Before you go fishing, you're going to need to know the five senses. And so if you can fake them out, if you can fool them on those five senses, you have a good chance of catching a fish. You've got a big edge on them, yeah. Well, Ed, you can learn an awful lot from that seminar about fishing, but this casting plug right here is the one I use to beat everybody. Everybody at speed casting, Bob. Well, you've beaten a number, but I don't think you've beaten everybody, have you? 
darn close. Dar darn close. I tell you what, I use this and I offer to anybody who can beat me this art print right here, Grandpa's Little Angler. I'll take about four or five people on every evening and if they can tie me or beat me, I'll give them that art print, but it doesn't happen very often. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Well, that's okay. Let him go. He can have the whole time. Oh, a rimmer. You can tell he's been from Michigan outdoors. He stands up here and talks. There's one. Huh? I'll take everybody. Anybody. Beat me. Tie me. Oh, close. How, far, how long we got? There's about 20 seconds left. Oh, two more caps. Uh, I launched out too high. I got it. 15 seconds? seconds to go. It's called Trilene Speed Cast Competition. Huh? Huh? Trost is not in this, by the way. We have about five seconds. Time is now up. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Ed. Who's next? This casting plug is doing it for me. Fred, where did you, now really, where did you learn to cast like that? I'm just good. <laughs> what can I say? I don't know. Very frankly, folks, I don't know. And modest, too. And modest. Yeah, yeah, right. That makes it more fun when I put on the dog a little bit about it. But we've seen an awful lot of people down here at the show. A lot. A lot. Coming by the booth, picking up our uh, Club Digest where they can get the recipes, sign up for club membership. A lot of questions. Oh, yeah. Pretty I think fun. the neatest thing is, is talking to the viewers. People who have seen the show and come down and say they've seen the show and, and shaking, right. our, shaking their hands, that's the greatest. And enjoy it. So, right. Enjoy. Sign a few autographs. It's kind of a kick. The kids down here are great, too. They're full of questions, and they really get excited to, to see us down here. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. What do you want me to do? Sign this for me. Sign it for you? Uh -huh. Well, what's your name? J-O-E-Y, Joey. J-O-E-Y, Joey? Uh -huh. I think we're, I can do that. We're, we're, we're detectives. You're detectives? What are you looking for down here at the boat show? Well, uh, a near, near game of water. Some water? Uh-huh. Huh. I'll be done. The people you meet at the boat show, it's really something. Let's see, Joey. I'm going to write here, good fishing. Sign my name. There you go. Joey? Here you go, Joey. There it is. An autograph. What do you think of... Well, there he goes. I don't know what to say about that. Joey, I want to see you over the casting pond one of these days.